Hello, and welcome to the Design News webinar, Beyond the Basics, Creating Extrusions to Meet Product Challenges, brought to you by the Aluminum Extruders Council. I'm Ann Thrift, Senior Technical Editor for Design News, and I'll be your moderator today. This webinar is designed to be interactive. Learn about today's speakers, view additional resources from our sponsors, share and talk about this webinar via various social media outlets, and submit questions by clicking on the widgets in the dock at the bottom of the console. Please ask questions at any time during the presentation by typing your question in the Ask a Question widget and clicking Submit. Submit questions as they come to mind, and our speaker will address them during the Q&A session as time permits. At the end of the webinar, we will ask you to complete a short survey. Please take a moment to fill this out, as your feedback is important to us, and it will provide valuable information on the subjects covered in this webinar, as well as how we can improve future broadcasts. And now I'm pleased to welcome Mark T. Lander, Inside Sales Representative at Alexandria Industries. A lifelong tinkerer, Mark has a knack for fixing things that don't work. This ability, plus more than 30 years of experience in the manufacturing industry, translates well to his role at Alexandria Industries, where he helps customers find solutions to their product development needs. And now we've got a poll question. We'd like to ask the audience this question. We've got four different answers, so please listen to them and pick the right one for you. The question is, what is your reason for attending today's webinar on designing with aluminum extrusions? The four possible answers are general background, I have little, little or no experience with extrusions. I'm familiar with extrusions but looking to see what's new. I'm interested in extrusions for a future project. Or I'm currently working on a project where I anticipate using extrusions. And now we'll wait a minute or two while you answer before we see the results. And here are the results. The question again was, what is your reason for attending today's webinar on designing with aluminum extrusions? Uh, the first one, general background, I have little or no experience, was 16.9%. But the vast majority of you guys said, I'm familiar with extrusions, but I'm looking to see what's new at 54.7%. 7.5% of you said that you're interested in extrusions for a future project. And another fairly large group, 20.7%, said that you're currently working on a project where you anticipate using extrusions. Mark, what do you, what do you think about these? What's your take on, the, on how the results came out? Well, I'm excited to see that there are a lot of people that are familiar with extrusions and uh, looking to see what's new and put them into new applications. So with that, we'll get going. Uh, today's agenda is a simple presentation that will provide the overview of aluminum extrusion alloys, geometry design features, and value-added fabrication options. We'll also touch on different fabrication options beyond what's common, and together how all of this can help you solve your new product development challenges using aluminum extrusion. Aluminum extrusions offer designers the ability to produce a wide range of geometries from mechanical components to electronic medical housing units to heat sinks. The top left photo is a mechanical coupling used in a medical radiation therapy machine. This component is approximately one and, a, one and a half inches by half inch in size, so fairly small. The center photo is a medical housing unit. In it you can see grooves that run along the inside of the component, which do hold electronic circuit boards. The bottom center photo is a housing unit for a 250 horsepower electric motor used in vehicle propulsion systems. The inside diameter is 131 millimeters, or just under 5.2 inches. The rectangular hollows located around the circumference are for coolant. This component is made from 6,000 series alloy that is able to hold very tight tolerances for the con concentricity and circularity. And I would also like to add that 
all of these components are made from 6000 series alloy. Okay, the top left item here is an interior LED light fixture, while the lower left image shows a node of a display system using slices, if you will, of multiple void hollow extrusions to orientate the cords. The bottom right component is a light bar, which we'll talk about later in other slides, and a medical system at the top right is where the coupling you saw on the previous slide is used to open and close mechanical leaves that regulate doses of radiation therapy. Aluminum extrusions can also be used in functional or decorative applications as shown here. The upper left image is a light fixture for a medical operating suite. The upper right photo shows the body of the Ford F-150, which employs about 50 pounds of extrusion for the front end structural elements roof bows, and tubular pillar structure. The Apple Watch sports an extruded and anodized case, and the lower right image is a decorative screen outside of a neighborhood baseball park in California. Here the custom extrusions were milled to give the varied glimpses of a ball field. It gives a contemporary interpretation of looking through the knot holes in an old wooden fence. Uh, everybody knows about Play-Doh machines, right? So here's a fun example showing how the aluminum extrusion process works. Note the different die shapes. Not too much different from shapes that you might see or, or the way the process would happen in an aluminum extrusion. For the hollow die shape in the lower right-hand corner, you can see how the Play-Doh can flow through the opening between the part of the die that forms the outside diameter and the inside mandrel supported by the two horizontal supports, <clears throat> the Play-Doh separates into two tube halves and then welds back together due to the pressures needed to make it flow through the annular opening in the tube shape. Here is a very basic view of the actual aluminum extrusion process. It shows the aluminum billet on the left, the steel die, support tooling, and then the extrusion profile or shape. The extrusion process begins with heating a billet, pushing it through the die, cutting the profile to a reasonable workable length, stretching the extrusion, cutting the profile again, and then heat treating or aging the extrusion to the desired temper or hardness. Altogether, the metal and extrusion process convert ideally to quickly and inexpensively endless component and product designs. The benefits of aluminum such as the high strength to weight ratio, corrosion resistance, and electronic conductivity, to name a few, make it an ideal material for extrusion. Aluminum extrusion is a cost-effective process that offers designers the ability to make complex shapes with close tolerances. The advantages of aluminum combined with the extrusion make extrusion an ideal material and production method of choice for product development in a wide range of applications and markets. As of March 2014, there were 513 alloys registered with the Aluminum Association. This does not include proprietary alloy variants. Note that there are now more than 100 different 6000 series alloys. When it comes to designing your aluminum extrusion component, the key design variable is understanding the difference among the alloys and then selecting the appropriate alloy for the extrudability and end use. The components end use can dictate the optional alloy process and operation. Now, engineers can and typically default to 6061 because it's considered an engineering grade and available at most local hardware stores for prototyping. Prototypes are made and then the designer becomes locked into the alloy which may or may not be extrudable due to the shape. Remember, while most profiles can be machined from a solid bar stock, they may not always be extrudable. Aluminum extrusions can be produced in different alloys and process, processes to uh, different tempers to achieve your desired mechanical properties. Now, just a minute ago, I talked about the range of available alloys. With 
with the 6000 series of aluminum alloys having the most alloy to choose from, this series gives us the widest variety of applications for extrusions. By tempered designation, we mean hardness. Generally, when the aluminum exits, exits the extrusion press, it becomes, comes out as a T4 temper. As I said before, extruders use aging ovens to bring the extrusions to a T5 or T6 hardness. On this chart, we compare the 6063, 6061, and 7004 series of aluminum alloys. Note that the trace amounts of the different minerals do matter. The 7000 series, for example, there are higher amounts of minerals which take away from the percentage of pure aluminum in the alloy. This does make the 7000 series a harder pushing or difficult to extrude alloy. The alloy listed here, going from the top to the bottom, are based on ease of extrudability. As you move, move your way down the list, the extrudability factor goes from 100 to 50, as noted in the last column. The design variables here also show the alloy surface finish and blendability. Not shown here, a new alloy on the market, 6560. It's a leaner alloy. It's really good for thin wall applications, such as a high ratio heat sink. 6560 does have many of the same qualities of the 6063. As an example of the kind of alloy developing going on, one aluminum extruder council member has begun extruding 5083 for auto applications. While the predominant use for 5083 has been in the marine applications, some 5083 sheet and plate has been used in autos. Often rolled shapes were employed that required secondary applications and costly tooling. By tweaking a standard 5083 alloy, the extruder was able to achieve higher mechanical properties and extrude a near net shape that minimized secondary pro processing and cost. This graph represents the increase in alloy strength based on the amount of silicone and magnesium. Note the overlap between the alloys of the different groups, like 6060, 6005A, and 6063 in typical applications of each alloy. Also note that there is a wide range of silicone and magnesium for each alloy. Thus, there can be significant variations in behavior, performance for a given alloy, depending on the actual mix employed. This graph just shows another way of looking at the extrudability versus strength when comparing the strength of aluminum to that of mild steel. Now, everything does come with a price. The harder the aluminum alloy is to push, the higher the cost to extrude it. In other words, the price for the higher mechanical properties achieved is poorer extrudability. The extrudability index indicates the extrudability in comparison to a standard 6060 alloy. This simply shows the three classes of extrusion, solid, semi-hollow, and hollows. Solid is fairly self-explanatory. There are no hollow voids. A semi-hollow is kind of a cross between a solid and a hollow. Note the desired T shape in the narrow tongue that would have to support the wider T portion above. While this is extrudable, certain adjustments are made to the extrusion die during the building phase to allow for the extreme extrusion pressures. Now, this may be a good time to, to say that um, the extrusion pressure on the die face can be upwards around 100,000 PSI when extruding some 6,000 series alloys. The hollow is simple as well. Any shape that has a mandrel completely surrounded by aluminum alloy. Here's a, an example of many different opportunities you could have to utilize features along the length of the extrusion for locating any number of fasteners. Things from a dovetail, grooves for a printed circuit board, heat sink fins, slots, groove for a screw head, and flutes for appearance are just to name a few. Now some key design variables are you know to keep an eye on when you're in your design phase are, are, are keeping things uniform. 
balanced wall thicknesses, smooth transitions, generous tapers, round corners, not sharp corners. If a sharp corner is needed, consider corner relief, basically undercutting. Corner radiuses is as large as allowable, but 20 thousandths minimum is a good starting point. Dies are, are cut with a, a wire EDM with a 10 thousandths diameter wire, thus requiring, a, for instance, a 20 thousandths radius on an, eye, on an inside corner. The larger fillets and corner radii create easier flow for the die. Symmetry of a profile, uniform wall, smooth wall transitions. Whenever you can, practice symmetry. Minimize asymmetrical details. You can help in enhance your visual surfaces using grooves, webs, ribs. Help minimize perimeter cross-section ratio. And die tongue ratios. This is uh, an area that can trip up first-time designers. Based on the survey that we've seen, I think a lot of people may have been through this already. But it is thought that aluminum is so hot, boy, it must flow like water. And that that is more, more true or, or less. While the exit temperature is around 1,050 degrees, the melting point, point is closer to 1,200 degrees which maintains a fairly solid mass and it will not exactly flow like water, but it must be allowed to fill the extrusion profile. Remember the amount of PSI it takes to press that billet, around 100,000 PSI. Now, this is a, a print of a, of a simple mandrel, or a, excuse me, just a simple void, as if it were a, a steel tongue. and. As you can see, the better design on the right, it shows that it's very even all the way around. So your pressures around that mandrel, or around that tongue, are going to be more even, and you're going to get less variance, and the die will run more stable. The difficult design on the left, it's not that it can't be ran, but what you will get is all that mass on the left-hand side. Your, your aluminum's going to want to flow through that area because it's bigger. This is where the aluminum does want to take the path of least resistance. And it's going to cause that tongue to flex over to the right far more than the picture on the right. And that's going to cause more variation of where that tongue is going to end up and cause more die breakage. Now, both of these profiles can be extruded with a semi-hollow die. However, the one on the left will be far more difficult and adds cost due to slower extrusion speeds and higher die breakage with the tongue offset to the right. Now, as we've been discussing, there is a minimal amount of steel that is required in the extrusion die to prevent breaking. And here we see a 30 degree opening versus a 60 degree opening. Note how much wider the steel is or is going to be allowed on the 60 degree opening to prevent the die from breaking. 60 degrees is the place to start whenever you are creating a screw boss. Again, here's another example in the upper right hand, <coughs> excuse me, the upper right hand corner of designing a profile that would have better extrudability as a solid. Below we see a, a hollow die that would require two mandrels. An example on the left, we have a, a single void hollow die with smooth transitions versus a multi void hollow die. Or in this case, 10% less cost, lighter, and likely to have less die breakage. Going from a solid extrusion on the left to a complex multi void hollow on the right significantly improves improved weight reduction, eliminated secondary operations due to the screw bosses, and actually improved thermal performance for this heat sink due to the increased surface area. So sometimes a complex hollow die will offer a superior solution. Be sure to consult your extruder prior to finalizing the profile. Now in this example, this is a, a simple design that, that would have come in. It shows three extrusions that need to be sawed, 
machined, anodized, assembled with six screws. Now, when you get your extruder involved early and you ask for some suggestions for solutions, sometimes these kind of solutions can show up. In this revised design, you have two extrusions to saw, machine, anodize, and assemble, but with only two screws. This design reduced the extrusion profiles by one and eliminated some of the machining and reduced the amount of assembly screws required by four. Note the use of the fluted surfaces and drill lines to minimize surface defects and flow lines and handling marks on these wider surfaces. Design with some surface finish in mind. Remember your extrusion will require a run out surface. This is the surface that comes out and lays down on the, on the table, whatever kind of table your extruder has. This is when fluted surfaces are a great alternative to prevent cosmetic rejects. Alloy selection is also a determining factor in cosmetics. For instance, while 6061 has an RA of around 125, 6063 can have an RA of 63. Design dimensions for functionality. Do not use standard block tolerances unless it's quite generous and tolerances should apply to critical features only. Very difficult to measure features, especially small features such as a 20 thousandths radius on corners, short legs, and angles should be called out as non-functional so they are not measured. Datums allow for consistent inspection processes. Inspection can be Primary problem without datums. Discuss the method of inspection with your extruder to help minimize inspection differences. This is a table from the Aluminum Association Standard Manual and shows some tolerances applied to extrusion profile. The Aluminum Association tolerance standards are just starting points. Use these as a reference guide when understanding what to expect in the extrusion process. Many extruders can do better than these tolerances. One note I, I do want to point out that the larger the circle size, the larger the tolerance requirement can be. Consult your extruder for tolerancing questions before you lock in your design. Now here's some questions you're going to face as designers, and some of you probably have already. Is the wall thickness important or the base of the gap? Or is the gap dimension or the hollow dimension? In this example, the overall tolerances will be different along one plane of this profile due to different ways that the measurement will be taken. Here are some parameters that will affect variation among tolerances. Alloy, of course, that's, that's always a big one. That will help dictate some extrusion speed. Profile will, will uh, indicate press size. Multiple die copies, just because you build one die and it runs one way and then you build a second die identical, they may not always run exactly the same. Multiple holes in a die. In other words, having more than one hole. Maybe you have three, four, five, six, eight holes in a die. The method of inspection between your extruder and the customer. Here are some more typical multi-void hollows. You see some of the 50 pounds of extrusion in the F-150 and a very similar application from the Tesla Model S. Also note the multi-void hollow structural rocker section from the forthcoming Cadillac CT6. See that the outer surface has been cut away to display how to show the inner configuration. In another multi-void hollow application with demanding tolerances, the key was to do reduce the weight and the part count in a steel-based automotive panoramic sun sunroof application. This revamp mechanism is a six-piece assembly, two extrusions plus four small aluminum stampings. The solution lowered the weight by 20% and reduced the part count by 22 pieces. 
The benefits of extrusion go way beyond themselves. Extrusions can be machined, formed, and assembled with a wide variety of familiar technologies. Yet some processes, such as bending and welding, benefit from prior extrusion fabrication experience. Here you can see an example, moving from left to right, the development of a key component to this framing element for a military tent system. We start with a section of a crosshatch, extrude a profile, then weld on a cap, round and punch the ears, powder coat, add a mechanical fastener, and then assemble. When you're creating some of the best world's loudspeakers, you don't want the cabinet impacting the sound. These extruded cabinets offer aluminum's high stiffness for minimum cabinet vibration, so no coloration is added to the sound. Now remember that light bar we talked about in slide six? Here it is on the truck roof and between the grill and the winch. There are multiple bending technologies available, available including stretch bending, CNC bending, and chain bending. Extrusions can be bent in both T4 and T5 condition. Even complex bends are doable, such as with this aftermarket light vehicle bar. The final design variable is fabrication. Most extruders involved in automotive have significant fabrication capabilities and know well how various alloys and geometries are best machined, joined, and bent. In the aftermarket light bar example, which is already a challenging part due to the 11 to 1 tongue ratio for the heat dissipation fins, the designer needed it bent and the wrong way to get the final part. So the process became to extrude, quench, stretch form, and then temper. The combination of choosing the best alloys for the end use, designing and geometric features, and considering follow-on fabrication can help you optimize component performance, reduce part count, eliminate fabrication and assembly steps, and easily bend, weld, and assemble components. We trust that we have given you more detail about some of the work going on in the extrusion industry to push the envelope of alloys, geometry, and fabrication. In closing, we urge you to en engage an experienced extruder early on. We are seeing too many cases of designs from intermediaries who have minimal understanding of extrusion parameters or failed attempts by suppliers not familiar with design flexibility and tolerancing. Our goal is to assist you in making the most effective use of extrusions. For more information on aluminum alloys, extrusion application, and design resources, uh, please visit our website at aec.org. You can also look at the aluminum joining manuals for more tips on joining technology. And finally, the Aluminum Association offers an aluminum design manual with standards and data on mechanical properties, limits, tolerances, just to name a few. Thank you for joining us today, and thanks to our webinar sponsors, SAP and Alexander Industries, along with all the members of the Aluminum Extruder Council. And I'll turn the webinar over to our moderator, who will provide instructions on the question and answer portion of the webinar. Thank you, Mark. Um, to our listeners, if you have a question, please submit it now using the Ask a Question box in the lower right corner of your screen. If we're not able to answer all the questions during the webcast, we will share the remaining questions with our speaker and he will respond to you directly. So let's see what we got. Um, looks like the first question is, what alloys allow for the most precise tolerances on the different classes of extrusion? Well, the, the, what you're going to want to look at is anything that can be mainly an air quench. Uh, in the 6000 series, uh, I would start out with a 6063 or a 6060. That 6560, the new kit on the block, is a good one. They're leaner alloys. Uh, air quenching is, is easier on the extrusion. Um, you you got to think about it this way. When 
the extrusion comes out of the press, we only have uh, a very limited window of time to cool the, the alloy to make the properties, just to bring it into a T4 state. And in some cases, we can use air, which is going to be, if you will, a little more gentle on the extrusion versus 6061. Uh, you're going to put water on it to make the properties. And and if, if you've ever poured water on something very hot, generally, you know, you can cause a lot more warping uh, and, 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 and just more distortion. Okay. Thank you, Mark. And we've got another question for you. Uh, page 17, I think they might mean slide 17. What strength is that? Let's see. Let's go. Okay. Page 17, what strength is that? I would say that that's going to be in a in a T6 state, if that answers the question. Okay. Um, to the person that asked that, if you if that didn't answer it, uh, please feel free to ask a, a slightly more refined question. Thank you. Okay. Um, next question is: Can you explain more about the three bending methods and its tolerances? Is that one for me, Ann? Yes, it is. I'm sorry, Mark. Oh, okay. Uh, three bending methods. Well, we have stretch forming, which is which is a, a very uh, complex form of bending, but a very a, a fairly accurate way of bending. It's it's where the extrusion product is the lineal is is extruded. Let's say I'm just going to pick a number. It's 10 feet long, in its extruded state. You then have a machine called a stretch former. That has a big, a big die on there. Generally, it's going to be a radial style um, shape to it, similar to that light bar. And you have jaws on each end of the, on some grippers that uh, grab each end of the profile, and it, it, it initially it pulls the profile tight to a certain, a predetermined, um, a predetermined amount. Then it starts to pull and wrap the extrusion around that radial profile, the die, the, the bending die. And then when it gets to the very end, it, it does a, a one last pull of, of a few percentage of the length of the part to, if you will, set the bend. And that's a very repeatable process. Okay. And now I have a question for Ken Fisher, and he's the Senior Applications Engineer from SAPA Extrusions, who's also joining us for questions. Ken, the first question I have for you is, I'm into, I am into integration of renewable technologies. I'm interested in, I think it says aluminum structure to mount solar panels. Uh, looks like general size of PV pane being 1.6 meters by 1 meter by 0.75. 0.075 meters and weighing 22 kilos. What aluminum alloy do you suggest? Thank you. Well, I think that uh, 6063 is always a good alloy to start with. Uh, as Mark uh, discussed, we get the best tolerances with that because it's air quenched and uh, generally very workable, very uh, flexible for different shapes. Uh, and then if, uh, if in your particular application, if that isn't strong enough, uh, I would suggest perhaps going to like a 6005A, just a somewhat stronger alloy, but uh, still air quenched uh, whenever possible. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question is also for you, Ken. For a wide, low profile panel extrusion, what is the best way to reduce warping or bowing? That's a great question, uh, and that's always a concern uh, when we're working with uh, wide panels. The first one is in uh, design, and that is uh, to make the panel 
uh, symmetrical whenever possible. Uh, that makes it the easiest to extrude. And then again, it comes back to which alloy you choose. Uh, an air quenched alloy uh, is, is much easier to control those tolerances uh, than, a, than a water quenched alloy. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is from Mark. What is the alloy cost difference between 6063 and 6560? Pardon me, Anne, I, I didn't quite catch that question. Sure, let me repeat it. What is the alloy cost difference? For I, I think they mean the cost difference between two alloys, which are 6063 and 6560. That price currently per pound is, is the same. It's the same. Okay. Thank you. Next question is for Ken. What is the difference between T6 and T6-1 temper? And then it's, it, this is a two-parter. The second part is what is the difference between 6005 and 6005A? I'll, I'll hit the second one first. Uh, the difference between 6005 and 6005A is, uh, is very slight. It's actually just a, a slight alloy tweak and the 6005A has a little bit uh, more improved toughness. Uh, and so both alloys are produced today, and uh, you'd want to talk to your extruder to see which one would uh, fit your application the best. Uh, as for the difference between T6 and T61, um, and maybe Mark could chime in on this, uh, generally uh, our stuff is, uh, is uh, aged T6 and then this with the undefined percent of stretch. And then if we do define the, the percent stretch, we would call it T6511. Um, sometimes the, the other numbers after the T6 apply to different processes. Uh, Mark, do you have another comment on that? that that's exactly how I would have uh, answered it. OK, great. Um, let's see, our next question. I think this one is for you, Mark. For microfin extrusion, what are the limits and rules when approaching, looks like 0.3 millimeters fin thickness as two millimeters height? Well, when you're, if it is 0.3 millimeters in fin thickness, um, I don't know that that could be extruded so much as you, you may need to go to a, a folded fin situation. I had to do the conversion. That's that's twelve thousandths wide, and and uh, I know that at Alexandria we wouldn't be able to do that. Now, possibly in a micro press, I, I guess Ken, would you would you have an an idea if that if that's doable? I think that's ex 0.3 millimeters is extremely small. Uh, we have some abilities to make small stuff, but I think that uh, that's really small. I'd have to see a very specific uh, print on that and uh, review it. So I think that's case by case. OK, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Ken. What engineering resources, software, application engineers, et cetera, do extruders typically have that we can draw on? That varies uh, quite a bit by different extruders, uh, and uh, so you'll have to ask your individual extruder uh, what uh, application engineers they can provide. Uh, some companies have uh, a very large team, uh, and uh, others uh, have a smaller team, but it, all extruders will be able to uh, look at your section and be able to tell you where the problems might be and what the tolerances would be uh, some companies have more people that uh, that can help you with your product design. So depends on the company. Okay, thank you. Uh, it looks like the next question is from Mark. Um, it says, I like the slide that showed all the features that can be built into the extrusion. Is there a document that has pre-designed features, i.e. screw boss, hinges, etc.? I don't know that there is one pre-designed that the Aluminum Extruder Council has. Um, I don't want to make a sales pitch here, but here at Alexandria we do have one that we designed uh, that does show the, the screw bosses and screw chases, uh, not, ne not necessarily the hinges. Uh, but 
but it is one of those cases where um, your extruder should be able to help you um, arrive at the proper sizes for, for your application. Okay, great. Uh, the next question, um, either of you could answer, so jump in whoever wants to. How does temper affect conductivity on 6101? For example, T61 versus T64, et cetera. Are the press practices the same and only differences in aging? Uh, boy, I'd have to go uh, look up uh, some details on that one. I don't have anything off the top of my head. Okay, Mark so anything? maybe we No, I, I, I don't know. I'd okay, be happy to, to, to get, get back, back on that one. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, let's see. The next one is from Mark. It says, Mark, we have wrinkles on the inner side after bending the profile. What can we do to avoid wrinkles? Uh, if, it's a, if it's a hollow shape, <clears throat> one thing you could do is possibly add a, a filler of some sort uh, during the stretch form process. We, we, will, we will add like a, uh, a bladder is what we call it. It's, it's made out of a, a very soft rubber that we, we have to literally pull in and pull out with a hoist system that we have. If it's a solid shape, uh, let's, let's just say like that light bar in the example uh, in the slides, uh, you, can, you can put in that inner channel some plastic filler, some plastic strip to help fill that up to help prevent some of that wrinkling. Okay, great. Let's see, the next one is for Ken. What applications is 6056 typically used for? What is its weldability? Uh, we're not extruding 6056, so I don't have that answer off the top of my head. Mark, is that one that, that you guys are, are extruding? No, we do not extrude 6056 either. Okay, we'd have to go back and uh, look that one up. Okay. I apologize. Sure. Uh, the next one is for Ken also. Um, please talk about adding surface features. Uh, I'm not sure if the that's a pretty broad question. Uh, maybe the person question, asking this question could uh, could ask could again with some more details. Uh, okay. I'm I'm assuming we're talking about adding surface features uh, to hide some of the flow lines and things like that. Uh, or uh, which would be any type of uh, ribs or small ribs or, or other cosmetic features to, to hide the flow lines, so which don't really affect the extrusion itself in terms of the weight or cost. Uh, if we're talking about features for, uh, for functionality, uh, that's something that uh, the extruders always love to do, which is to add things like screw bosses and, and slots and things like that that uh, uh, combine other parts together uh, into one extrusion. Uh, it's one of the, the great things about extrusion is, is adding multiple features and reducing part count. Okay. The next question is from Mark. Is it possible to, to weld aluminum and steel? What are the difficulties? Uh, as far as I know, no. Uh, welding aluminum and steel are, are two completely different uh, things. Uh, aluminum does have a lower melt point than steel does, and uh, and those two materials are, are just too dissimilar. Mark, if I can jump in on that. Oh. Uh, there, are num there are a number of people who are claiming uh, to, to weld steel and aluminum, uh, and oh. I think that what what you'll really find is that uh, they're really brazing uh, the aluminum to the steel, even though they're calling it welding. Uh, and okay. sometimes the line between brazing and welding gets very, uh, very blurred. Um, sometimes friction stir welding and sometimes uh, a pulse arc welding. Uh, but uh, it's... Uh, it's a it's a difficult technology. I know the automotive people are looking at it uh, quite a bit. Uh, it's sort of a holy grail, uh, but there are a lot of difficulties with it for sure. I learned uh, something next, new. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, the next one is for Ken. Is the basic screw boss geometry the only method to fasten to extrusion? Do you have a source for other geometries that might provide a stronger interface? 
Oh gosh, there's a there's a million ways to uh, attach extrusions to each other and uh, and to other materials and uh, certainly the uh, the guide that's available on the AEC website is a great place to start. Um, but there are a number of possibilities uh, such as uh, self-tapping screws. There are uh, snap fits, uh, which work great uh, both uh, down the length of the extrusion and across the extrusion. Um, there are there's a tremendous number of ways to to fasten extrusions together. Uh, in terms of sources of geometries, again, I would uh, I would refer you to the the joining document that's available on the AEC or the Aluminum Association websites. Uh, it's a great place to start. Okay. The next question is from Mark. How does 6360 that you mentioned as a newbie alloy differ from 6063? What are the advantages and disadvantages? The, 60, uh, the 6360 or 6560, and there, there's a, a little bit of a difference here when I get to those specific alloys, but the 6360, 6560 are leaner alloys, which allow them to extrude easier, if you will. And, and any time you can have an alloy extruding easier, you can do a little bit more complex shape or a thinner wall. Uh, that's why I had, I had mentioned, you know, maybe a higher ratio heat sink where you're, you're filling that entire fin uh, and, and, and pushing it into a small area. Now, one of the, one of the disadvantages here is, is of the, the 6360. Uh, that is proprietary to only one manufacturer right now so you know if if indeed they wanted to do something special with uh, pricing they could uh, it's not it's not readily available with with all smelters okay the next question is for Ken um, Ken is MIG or TIG welding better for 6063 slash 6061 and why this is very dependent on the application, and uh, both MIG and TIG are very appropriate for uh, 6063 and 6061. Uh, TIG welding is used in extremely controlled environments uh, and where uh, very uh, high strength welds and very cosmetic welds are required, uh, and oftentimes with difficult geometry. Uh, whereas a MIG weld is, uh, is easy to uh, put on a robot, uh, much higher production volumes. Uh, that's, it's often said that uh, TIG is tidy and MIG is messy, uh, but in the grand scheme of things, uh, both processes will generate good quality welds, but generally speaking, MIG is much higher uh, production volumes. Okay, the next question could be for either or both of you. Could you suggest other ways to join or attach aluminum and steel? Adhesive is a, is a very good way. Uh, that's, that's, be, that's come on the scene yeah, quite a bit. Um, there would yeah, also I, be I just agree. general fasteners. Yeah, or a combination of both uh, is right. also uh, popular, uh, where it's uh, adhesive is put on and then a certain number of fasteners are put in place until the adhesive cures. Okay, here's a related question. Can aluminum and steel be welded by magweld? I'll defer that one to Ken. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, you know, I'm not familiar with the mag uh, weld process. Uh, you know, that generally speaking, extruders are not always experts in in these uh, processes. So I would have to defer that to the to a uh, mag welding supplier. Okay. Next question is for Ken. My company buys many millions of pounds from various extruders, and almost all no quote semi hollows over over 4-1 ration, I wonder if it means a ratio, even in 6063. Uh, what are suggestions for how to get these quoted? Uh, I would suggest uh, 
and I, I'd want to see the the profile, of course. Uh, but uh, this is a good time to really talk to an application engineer, and I can say that, of course, because I am an application engineer, uh, and I'm sure uh, Mark would feel the same way. You know, the, to uh, really look at the the profile and, and see what is causing that uh, that no quote situation. Um, you. Ultimately, uh, our tools to make difficult extrusions are always slowing down the press, uh, whether it's a high tongue ratio or uh, a difficult profile or a tolerance issue. The, it, we always have to slow the press down to make these extrusions uh, come out, and uh, that, of course, raises the price, which has lots of issues ever, uh, you know, Extruders don't want to do it. Customers don't want to pay for it. So the real answer is to see if we can design an extrusion that works for both the customer and the extruder. Okay. The next question is for Mark. Can 6560 obtain full T6 properties equivalent to 6063? 6560 can be H to a T6. The properties are going to be very similar to a 6063, but not exactly. And and there are uh, uh, plenty of documentation out there to show what the mechanicals are and, and all the properties. Okay, it looks like we have time for one more question for either Mark or Ken. Is there a common standardized way how to specify how many scratches are allowed in products, uh, parenthesis ALU 6063? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, and I will have to look up the standard uh, for that. But there, there is a cosmetic standard available. Right. It's not commonly used. Okay, thank you. Well, that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you, Mark and Ken. Design News appreciates your time and effort to help make this webinar a success. And lastly, thanks to everyone in the audience. We appreciate your attention and participation. We hope that what you heard and saw today was interesting and helpful. This presentation will be available shortly in an on-demand format. As a registered user, you will receive an email with detailed information on how you can access the on-demand replay of this webinar. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been able to listen to the event. This webinar is copyright 2015 by Design News. The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by AEC. The individual speaker is solely responsible for his content and opinions. Thanks for joining us and have a great